Hello and welcome to the Panelcast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, Beyond 2020, the technologies and trends that will define 2021. On this event, you'll hear from experts at Rubrik and SolarWinds. Thank you so much for joining us on the Panelcast. We've got a great event lined up for you. This is going to be 100% live. We have taken your challenges and questions that you submitted on the landing page to define today's topics on the panel cast. Before we jump into it, you should know that my name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as your moderator. We want this to be an educational event. We encourage you to submit questions live there in the questions box of your audience console. And while we're talking about ways to help you solve your challenges submitted on the event landing page, we'll also be monitoring the questions queue and we'll be responding live to as many of those questions as we can. We also have additional resources available there in the handouts tab. I encourage you to check those out before you leave the event today. And finally, at the end of the event, I'll be announcing the winner of our three Amazon $100 gift card prizes. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. Prize terms and conditions can be found in the handouts tab. Now, before I introduce you to today's expert presenters, I want to just briefly set the stage for today's topic. At the end of 2020, can we just take a moment and say goodbye? Goodbye, 2020. Based on the challenges submitted on the landing page, I know that many of you have struggled with challenges related to the pandemic, new workplace rules, policies, many of you working from home remotely, all of us on Zoom. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? And I'm sure that more than one of you who've been working from home have felt just like this. But on the other hand, I know many of us, we should just be thankful, thankful for our health, thankful for our employment. And most of all, thankful for the additional time at home that we got to spend in 2020 with our family. So as we make that jump from 2020 to 2021, we've got a lot of innovative technologies out there that can help to make our life more efficient, more productive, and help us to overcome these challenges to make 2021 the best year yet. And that's exactly what we'll be covering on today's event, using innovative technology and expert advice from industry veterans, who I'm excited to introduce you to now. My two special guests today are Liz Beavers, head geek at SolarWinds, and Robert Rame, director of market intelligence at Rubrik. So with that, let's get started. Hi, Robert. Hi, Liz. Great to have you on. Thanks, David. Hey, Liz. Thanks, David. Great to be here, guys. Happy to be joining. Awesome. So uh, it's really a pleasure to have you both on Best Questions, in, in our opinion. Uh, the first question is here on the screen. Uh, so how do we balance the and desires with work from home policies? Uh, I'll start with you, Liz, first. Uh, any suggestions for these folks dealing with work from home challenges? Sure. So as someone who's pretty new to uh, work from home as a reality, I previously had really only ever known um, the occasional need to work from home. So for me personally, um, it's been quite an adventure, as I think it's been for many other individuals and organizations in navigating this new landscape. Um, and in some cases, uh, even navigating what is this hybrid uh, life going to be working like. Um, so one of the items that comes to mind uh, for me, um, particularly with the IT community as well, is and balancing those needs and desires with those policies. Um, one of the biggest ones, aside from deterring burnout and making sure that everybody is able to work successfully, um, has drilled down in many of my conversations to things like asset management um, and making sure that users have the devices that they need to be successful. Um, and that's not only a need, that's not only a desire, I should say, that's an absolute need, right? I need my computer to be able to join events like these, um, to be able to perform my other calls. So I think um, with this pattern of the continuation of working from home um, and others, again, kind of moving to some of those hybrid models as well, um, we have a real 
set of new working parameters for what asset management looks like, how we can ensure that employees' devices are still working for them, how do we issue new ones, or in some instances, how are we going through and taking those back if we have users that migrate through the company? Um, so that's a big one that comes to mind. I don't know about you, Robert, what are some of the, the challenges or, or, again, some of those desires that, that you've been pairing? Yeah, so I'm I'm a I'm a 10 year veteran, and I worked from home uh, partially before that for about six years. So I've been doing this for a long time, and it's uh, I think really what it comes down to is is that um, this is a cultural thing, and um, if I've I've been seeing a lot of desire to potentially and actually I just just read a news article about it about monitoring tools and things like that, and I think that you know we need to recognize that we're in a in a very temporary time. Um, what, where, what we're doing right now is not going to last a very, I mean, it's not going to last decades. We may see some drift, but that's going to be a cultural shift over time. So one of the things that I think that, that, um, we need to look at is that work from home is a purposeful thing. It's a cultural shift, uh, that we're going to need to, uh, incorporate into the business processes. Now, wh why do I say this? It, um, uh, a mentor of our CEO did a presentation internally. His name is John Chambers, the former CEO of, of, um, of Cisco. They did a work from home thing uh, over 10 years ago. It was about 12 years ago. Cisco, remember that company? And they tried it out. <laughs> and what they found is, is that after about a year, if you don't get teams together, what winds up happening is, is that you get culture drift. So we're about at the one year point and we're going to start seeing that. So keep your eyes open. I think we'll hit that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, Liz, have, have you all seen that yet? Go for it. Oh, hopefully I'm not breaking up as badly now. I just You're checked gonna... my connection. Um, but I was going to say, I'm so glad you brought culture into the equation. I really think that it helps to humanize what our IT community is doing. And I certainly see the importance of maintaining your organizational culture, but also we're social creatures, right? We have to have that link to humanity that's been really challenging if we've not had traditional remote cultures. Um, so I think from that instance, peeling back some of the layers, what we're using for communication sources has been instrumental in ensuring there's still that advocacy for your organization's culture. So being able to have those video calls where you're doing kind of a mind map or brainstorm with one of your other colleagues that traditionally I would have just yelled over their cubicle about, um, that has been so important. So I think we're seeing, I think at the top of the pandemic, we had a lot of those happy hours, a lot of those connection brainstorm points that were taking place. They petered off a bit because I think everybody was having a little bit of virtual back up, especially as we near the holidays, you know, part of the culture was having those organizational celebrations together. Um, so I'll certainly be yep. keen to see how we continue that forward. But I I'm so glad that you brought that up, Robert. Yeah. I think that one of the things that, that I, I see is, is like the, the productivity monitoring is solutions. What we need to look at is, is this is this is a temporary phase. We're not going to get if we think that we're going to get more productivity out of out of employees than than we already are going to get. What are you going to replace these people? You're going to fire them. Uh, how's that going to make you um, position you in, in six months when things start to get that back to normal? Um, but my main thing really is, and that's exactly what you were talking about, Liz, and I, I just kind of did my finger like that, is that, that collaboration tools have not improved in 12 years. That they haven't improved in 15 years. I remember installing the SharePoint connector at back, I think it was like 2004, and thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to be able to live collaborate with my, my peers. And no. It hasn't happened. Now, now, granted, we could, with GDocs and, and uh, Office 365, you get some of that live collaboration features. But I mean, the main thing is, is that what we're missing right now is the coffee machine. We're missing the, the, the conversations in the, um, in the hallway. So what we need to look for is, is some way to bring that back, the, these, these non, these like non-formal collaboration and and now now balancing the company needs with the the desires i think really what that winds up being is is that, that yes we've got a desire to get a lot of things done but if you're not an empathetic person or empathetic organization what you wind up being is you 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 fail to acknowledge that this is a temporary situation that we're in um and i'm just Absolutely. we're just trying to get by for the next couple months so 
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so great. I don't know. That's I think great that's, advice, that's, 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 Liz and Robert. But uh, one one other thing, um, if you want to make somebody's mood worse, tell them you've got surveillance. Like now, I I in in Europe anyway. I'm over here in Germany. It's illegal to have uh, a camera sh pointing at you while you're working. But we're talking about some of these solutions that are out there that are actually taking screenshots of or, or shots of you from the, mm -hmm. your video while you, while you're. I mean, how how demoralizing is that going to be? I mean, you've already got some stress with family, the kids, um, the just looking at the, the 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 COVID numbers. Sorry, I said the word, but I mean it. And then you take that on, you layer that on top. What we're trying to do is 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 not necessarily um, make folks feel more stressed. It's it's actually remove some of that. And I think that uh, we've already demonstrated. You just have to look at what people are doing. If yeah. they're not meeting their objectives, then you know, you're you're not making your projects. Then 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 you're you're you don't need surveillance really. Well, and I think to that point too, Robert, before we move on to another one of those great questions um, that we had seen, David, I think in balancing this as well, we are going to continue, as you said, this is temporary. So I think we're going to see more organizations that are going to be moving to that hybrid structure where they are able to support um, some folks Absolutely. who ought to do the five day work from home and others who do like a three, two um, and, and have that balance to strike because I think what's been so instrumental through all of this is the ability to demonstrate user success and productivity that's been able to be maintained um, in what hasn't been a traditional environment for them. So I certainly think that we'll continue to see more teams that are diverting to this hybrid model. Geographic liberation for talent sourcing is one of the things I call it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that silver, silver, silver side, the uh, silver lining of the cloud. I mean, if, if if you've got problems with skills, which everybody does, then you know maybe you can start looking for further afield. I mean, that's. But then again, it's a very purposeful thing. I'm going to return to that thing sure. repeatedly. This is a purposeful thing. You can't just say, "Oh, well, we're going to hire somebody in in um, Ohio and think that they're going to be successful without having supporting." Um, functions and collaboration tools that, that are available to them. Sorry, we're, we're, I'm getting long winded, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Liz, do you want to read this one and we can go for it? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, so for one of the next items that came up that we heard from um, you all was around remote work security issues. Uh, so suggestions for better securing remote work environments. Uh, Robert, I'll actually kick this one to you to start us off. Okay. So uh, I, I have an office that I can lock up and close. I've got physical security. I've got um, <laughs> a segmented network. Um, I've got um, the ability to lock things up, um, close it off, and it's not you know shared with a bunch of IoT devices and everything else. That's a rarity. Uh, not too many people have a ubiquity network with three v VLANs. Um, that so. I think what we're looking at right now is is that that, that um, one of the first things that you can do is probably phishing training. Um, now this sounds dumb, but uh, the urgency that's created by phishing is a very effective attack. Uh, so if you just tell people to think, if you teach them how to think when they're being attacked or creating a sense of urgency or something like that, I I know that you can reduce the the uh, the effectiveness now. That's not saying that the phishing isn't effective. It's usually effective. The red teamers I know are getting 60% plus. So uh, phishing is a great thing, but but um, I, I've been talking to organizations over here in Europe that say that the regulators have been turning their heads. Now that's not gonna last forever. And that's a good thing actually, um, because what we need to do is say, okay, the first part of 2020, we just said, okay, well, we're just gonna deploy and then secure after the fact. And we did that. Uh, so we've mm -hmm. been, you know, just just getting things out there, and and then then securing it af after the fact. Uh, Liz, I'll, I'll I'll pause there. I've got some more that I want to talk about, but I don't want to um, sit there on the soap. <laughs> No, you're quite all right. I am, I'm really glad that you brought that up. I think that it's something that's really important for 
better securing our remote environments is number one, just like you said, training. There has to be the empowerment for your users to understand what security protocols that we have in place so that I can be more mindful in my actions at my now home office or when I come back to my in-person office. It's so important. I'm a huge proponent of employee empowerment for a lot of different things. And security, I think, is a huge one. Paired with that, I also think that it's really important beyond the educational sector you have to keep your systems and your software updated. So having momentum, even in an automated fashion to ensure that you have eyes on what your uptime is, what things are working well, what needs to go through and have routine, excuse me, maintenance performed on it is also going to ensure that level of security and beyond security, hyper-availability, so that everybody maintains their productive day-to-day efforts. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something that, that um, I, I, I ha- having, um, making sure, for example, one of the things that, that um, when I, I was, I was just, just, I came to rubric from Gartner. So I was talking with a lot of analysts a couple of years ago, and, and we were looking at, at the top three uh, vulnerabilities that were used as exploits. And it was, Internet Explorer, Flash, and Adobe. And guess what? These were all patched like ages ago. So just having the patching, uh, uh, managing the endpoints, um, that's a, that's kind of a base level thing. Creating a checklist so that folks know, hey, wait a second, if, if I think I've been hit, what do I do? You know, just the, the basic, you know, mm-hmm. send them something that they should print out and stick to the inside of their um, their cabinet and, and, and when they're, they're panicked and they, they've been, you know, nailed by something, they're feeling like they're using the part of the brain that, that, um, just thinks about like fear. That's how they think. Actually, it's a psychological thing. Uh, they, they use their, their, their fear and their urgency and, and that type, that part of their brain to actually make these decisions. So let them know what their IT response is. Then next step. Okay. Do you have any IoT devices? Just give them a checklist. Do you have any IoT devices that uh, have default passwords? Change those. Look at um, all the different things that that um, uh, you know you need to do. Just create an easy to, easy to follow checklist so that folks can go through and audit and 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 say I have accomplished these things. You know, my router is not set with a de- default Wi-Fi password, uh, all these things, you know, that, because that's that's what will wind up happening. If, if um, you know, somebody gets in, they'll piggyback, then watch, um, and then try to uh, move from there and pivot through the environment. Absolutely. And, and I think something else that comes to my mind as well in, in working with other customers and hearing from other organizations and, and really just seeing 2020 continue to unravel, I think another key point, and I mentioned this actually at the top of our discussion, boils down to asset management and configuration management as well. So with this rapid realignment, teams had to ensure that their users not only were equipped with devices, but they had to know where they were now that we're geographically graphically diverse. They no longer had the luxury of saying, I know in this one building, we have 200 computers, all of these headsets and all of that good stuff. So now we're calling into also the use of personal devices alongside with company issue devices as well. So I think as we were talking about those, and <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we, oh, we talked I about patches. <laughs> But as we talked about securing and keeping those systems updated, it's also important to know what assets you have that are leveraging those systems that are in play day to day so that you can keep tabs on who's using them, who last logged in, are they online, are they offline, et cetera. Do, do you have BitLocker enabled? Do you have endpoint backups? Uh, or, or if you're using Office 365 or GDocs, do you have a backup of that? Uh, how easy is it to get that end user back up and running? Is there imaging exactly. available so that you can, you can send somebody? A, a, it's the process for getting this stuff to them and making sure that, that there's the, 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 a limited amount of, of interruption to their work environment. Um, yeah. I, but also, I'd say the checklist, create a, an easy to do checklist and IT response, phishing training, those three things would be mine. I mean, there's, there's the technological solutions and everything else that you can, you can throw at this problem, but that, uh, it's not a silver bullet. There's, there's, a, there's a, a couple of low hanging fruit um, 
things that you can do that, that would really help out a lot. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, it looks like um, David's video has dropped. David, can you still hear I, us? <laughs> I'm still here. I'm just going to be on audio only if that's okay. Perfect. Okay. Totally fine. At least, <laughs> at least I can communicate. Yeah, you all are just doing fantastic here uh, in this conversation, answering all these excellent questions, uh, such valuable advice. Are uh, you ready to go on to the next question? Yeah, sure. I actually think that Robert's most recent point was a great segue into that next question. Awesome. So a uh, next question uh, that we received from the audience is, uh, what are some ideas or strategies to use to motivate remote workers to be more productive at home? Uh, Robert, you made a great point that I know I need to work on, which is separating that personal from work time, making sure that you schedule time to exercise and have lunch and things like that. Yep. Uh, any more tips for us? Yeah, so I, I, I think one of the things that I did um, when I moved from South Carolina to Germany and then finally to France, um, I was kind of a workaholic when I moved over. And I got to France and they wanted these long lunch breaks. And I was thinking, oh, no, I, don't, I really do not have time for an hour and a half lunch. But what, what it comes down to is, is that your brain actually does need a break. It's just like a muscle. So, you know, we've been hearing a lot of organizations talking about the 25 minute meeting or the 15 minute meeting or 20 minute meeting, these weird, weird time slots. If you zoom is, is much more f uh, fatigue videos is, is wears you out because you have to concentrate. You don't have a lot of the physical cues. What I found at least when I was in France was that, um, that one hour and a half of leisurely walking to the, the, the cafeteria, having my meal, I didn't get into the wine, uh, having a coffee afterwards and then walking back, I got more done in seven and a half hours than I had been getting done working straight through. And I, 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 I think it's a testament really. If, if you, if you, um, if you do that, then, then I think that, 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 uh, take breaks, purposeful breaks, purposeful again, there's that word. <laughs> Liz, I love that I love idea it. of, yeah, I love that idea of those purposeful breaks. I um, am always very much so been somebody who operates off of like my own Kanban, if you will. I block my calendar and I have my slots of here is what I am expecting myself to do in this period of time. And then once I hit that block, if I've not completed it, I'd have to jot that down to say, okay, well, that's going to shift to a later block that I had also had open because just as you mentioned, Robert, that physical activity is key. I know for me, if I didn't have the opportunity to take my crazy dog for a walk um, or do a quick workout, I would not be sane <laughs> um, sitting at a desk. And especially now that it's we are forced to have our interactions all digitally, um, that has been really, really important to maintain that level of productivity. I also think just like we were talking earlier from a cultural perspective to continue to promote um, that high effectiveness, there's also the cultural adoption too. So having in those different team meetings where you might not get to see or speak to those people every day, but knowing that at the top of the week, I've got 30 minutes with these folks. Not only are we gonna be able to talk about what we're working towards and collaborate together, but also talk about, I saw this really cool movie this weekend does yeah. help to still facilitate that we're working towards the same goal and we still have that culture built into our day-to-day -day operations. Affirm affirmation, affirmation. I, I, I just, mm -hmm. I literally had just had a conversation last week with a CIO and I, I, I was just blown away at how, uh, I can't say gender, uh, how perfect this person was doing things. She, she, I did it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, she had created a, a, a um, she had, what we're dealing with one right now is, is that we are stratifying the hierarchy of management. We're, we're creating bottlenecks within the organization that, that does not allow the employees to have little conversations with the managers. So if you can create like a one hour thing or, you know, office hours in the morning and keep it pretty regular, this isn't the, the coffee machine talk or whatever. It's literally just time where people can drop in and they can remove bottlenecks from their days as opposed to having relying on emails, which is a, a, um, uh, maybe not the best way to, to explain something or trying to, to look for a reply via Slack or Teams chat, whatever. 
what you're looking for here is is to remove bottlenecks from your employees because the bottlenecks are what make them have a feeling like they're 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 trapped at their desk they're they're locked to their screen but they're not actually able to be productive because they don't have the either validation or affirmation that they are doing you know the right thing i suppose and just communicating sure. that is 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 a big deal yeah, absolutely. I, I think that fostering those little niches within your organization's culture and having just, as you said, those dedicated times and space are critical for that. Something else that I've spoken to other teams about as well um, to ensure productivity, if we step away from kind of the, the personal balance of things, but helping make sure that they get it done has been with knowledge management. That's been a huge topic of discussion this year because, again, we think about employee empowerment. How am I able to do my best job and make sure that what I need to do isn't impeded or disrupted by the technology that I'm relying upon? So making sure that I am well equipped with good knowledge base articles. So if my network is having an issue or I can't connect to my Bluetooth, I can look at easy step by step instructions of how to fix it that Ordinarily, my friend, I would have walked down the hall to ask for his help from, but now having good documented guidance around that has also been key in making sure that users are still productive and are able to get their tasks done. There's one, one more thing that I'll just kind of jump in there and then we probably ought to jump to uh, the next one, but uh, open vulnerability. Yeah. It's it's a it's a concept that uh, that popped up. I think it was written um, written about in 2019 by Gartner, and it. it so it's not pandemic. Wow. <laughs> anyway, but open vulnerability, it's, it's where you have a problem that, that um, you, you, you actually, if, if, you, if, you, if you as a manager and you're managing folks that are, that are doing their projects and they have problems, then they need to be able to have, to have the feeling that they can communicate openly to you about what problems they're having, what challenges they're having. And then you as a manager don't just expect that they deal with it, but that they are able to uh, get additional resources or assistance or mentoring or something so that they can get by this problem. Um, so what you're looking at is, is, is you take all the problems and challenges that, that, are, that are up against them, and then together you look at how you're going to solve that. And it's not just a one-way street where they're going to have to, you know, form a pod and, and deal with it. You know, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. it's literally like, okay, maybe this project, uh, is this project that important? You know, if it has to get delayed, then, then, and I know that sounds crazy. I know that there's, a, there's some people going, yeah, 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 that's going to happen in my organization. But you know what we're what we're talking about is is you know in 10 years is anybody going to remember this project in 5 years in 1 year is anybody going to remember this project is it going is it that big of an, a deal for the organization and if it is then take appropriate steps to support that person to make sure that they're successful great advice great advice robert and liz thank you let's let's keep on uh, moving here we got a lot of great questions uh, next one question number 4 uh, is uh, we had a number of comments around changing budgets. Obviously, companies are, uh, you know, downsizing. Some of them are expanding, and some of them are just reprioritizing. You know, um, different projects are, are are now higher priority. So the question was, how can I help the company increase revenue or optimize IT spend? Uh, Liz, you want to take that first? Sure. Um, and right before, I think that, um, again, not only is this a timely topic now, but right before we started our stream, Robert and I were discussing this um, in terms of, again, what we kicked things off with being fully remote for that forever <laughs> um, or having that hybrid structure and offices returning to and being opened up. Um, so I think that there is certainly still that consideration when we're looking at ways in which organizations are optimizing their spend. Um, and that boils down to the retail. Um, um, so are we going to have our physical buildings or not? Um, and I think that that's one item that certainly plays into it is your strategy for will we be remote? Will we be supporting hybrid? I also think in a discussion that I've had with a lot of teams as well in optimizing IT spend, 
they have to go through the process of an application cleanse. So reviewing what you currently have in your portfolio, what's being utilized, where do we have duplication? Where might we have an opportunity to streamline within one centralized platform or even integrate across some of those other key sources? And I think in doing that exercise and looking at your full portfolio is a great place to start to better understand where do we have opportunities to save? Where do we have opportunities to invest more time and expenses moving forward so that we're able to achieve those larger goals of the organization of IT? Robert, what do you think? So, so essentially, one of the things that I've, I've um, there was a CIO survey that came out in, in I think it was 2018, and in 2000, the beginning of 2018, I got the uh, the, the the access to the raw data. Um, that was while I was at Gardner, and I, I noticed something kind of funny that didn't actually get picked up in any of the research, but I mentioned it to, to a few of my my former colleagues um, afterwards, and that's that the um, about 70% of folks. Uh, when they're looking to transform their IT and get move ahead, they were cutting their expenses or cutting their spend on on infrastructure, for example, data center, thinking that they're just going to go to the cloud. And what that did essentially was created legacy. It created next year's legacy. Um, and the problem there is is that when when you actually look at it, seventy percent is that the right thing or the wrong thing? And one of the things that the I, the CIO survey does is it actually digs into the um, the who's the 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 folks on the, the the early adopters and everybody else and the what i found was the the first 20 something percent was increasing on-prem spend um now that that you can extrapolate it in a lot of different ways but if you're trying to avoid legacy debt not spending is a great way to get it <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing because it, 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 it's kind of counterintuitive. Now, what we saw was that, that a lot of things got reshifted, and then the CFO just said green lighted everything that, that did remote uh, SaaS, um, Okta, um, anything that had, had to do with Office 365, for example, um, or GDocs, just to be fair. Uh, mm -hmm. All that stuff got green lighted, but all the priorities that we entered 2020 with, they're back on top at the end mm -hmm. of 2020. It's interesting because in 2019, we've got it almost exactly the same priorities as at the, as the end of um, end of 2019. And that's, it's, but the, the reason for them is actually different. So for example, we've had ransomware, 400% increase um, according to the FBI. So security is a, is a big, big important thing. So, uh, and, and, and just look at your, 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 your cloud migration, your cloud strategy, all these things were, that were in your top five, they're probably the top five again. And I, I've been calling it a mulligan because it's the do, get, do over year, if that makes any sense. I'll just pause for yeah. a second because I don't, <laughs> no, it's it's true. And I, I think that's where, again, in, in speaking with other clients and looking at the landscape, we saw accelerated digital transformation, but we still have the same goals that we were trying to earmark last year as what we need to achieve into 2021. So I think the year of the mulligan is the most appropriate <laughs> term for so, what we've been going through. <laughs> what, what's sort of interesting is, is that the, the reason for asking this is because um, Maybe there's some new CIOs or IT leaders that are out there that are that are, that are watching this. Now, if you're watching this, listen to me. You need a co-conspirator. You need someone who can get a, po a project going that is high visibility, that's going to demonstrate your prowess at transforming the business and getting getting um, more productivity out of out of business. Now, if you can do that, then they're going to be a, a seller for you internally. Now this is this is really challenging because you don't have the coffee machine, you don't have the hallway conversations, you don't have. So that's why, again, purposeful. You're looking for some way to 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 create these these environments, and that's that's why I, I keep saying that collaboration is broken, and that's one of the reasons why I think that we're gonna we're gonna see a return to the office, almost needed, um, very soon. At least some um, some way of communicating with folks. So find a co-conspirator. Find a project, find a, a, a lighthouse project that you can deploy and, and, and make sure that, you, that the business understands what type of value you bring to, the, to them uh, so that they're willing to actually make the investment. Um, it's hard well, to quantify IT. 
And I, I think I, I like what you said about that as well in terms of, of bringing that to the table. And I think that that's a transformation that we've witnessed across this year is that IT is no longer our gatekeeper. They've been able to enact yeah. so much to ensure organizational ongoing productivity and success. So because they have shown up for lack of a better phrase, I think that they're going to be a trusted advisor to be at that table a bit more when it comes to the fiscal conversation, the big decisions that are going to be made moving forward, because they proved that in 2020, they helped a lot of organizations who never thought that they would be able to transition to remote it worked and it worked really well. So now we can continue with hybrid motions. By the way, I've got this great piece of software we've been looking at. So let's talk about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. There was, there was a lot of heroic activities that happened in, in the first half of 2020. It's, the stories that I heard were amazing. And I know that everybody listening to this is, was part of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Fantastic advice. Uh, the do over. I, I like that. Reminds me of the movie uh, Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Um, but um, <laughs> I got you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and so, speaking of projects, I mean, you mentioned uh, ransomware is up four hundred percent. We did have some questions around data protection and DR. Uh, they asked, "How can I convince clients and executives at my company that IT costs more to protect their business, and it's it's never." going to change? How can they convince them just how important a project like disaster recovery is? Uh, Robert, you want to take that first? Yeah, that's what Rubrik does. Uh, it, it, and, and if you think about it, the st cost of storage has dropped five to 10% over every year for years and years and years. But backup um, always stays a little bit more expensive. And, and, and there's always a disconnect. It's like, wait a second, this is an insurance policy I don't use, uh, or I only use like, you know, occasionally except this year has kind of changed and, and it's not just this year i i kind of feel like ransomware threat actors have grown up and we've let them grow up we've let the 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 everybody that's paid a ransom is you know it only takes a couple to make their financials work and the problem is is that, that they're really going after us hard and i'm not selling fear here i'm selling you know what i'm hearing through the grapevine and my sources and everything else about like some of the attacks that have been occurring and they're bad. They're not normal attacks. They flatten the entire environment. And if you don't see that, that all of your shiny um, intrusion detection, intrusion protection equipment. I mean, if you look at um, FireEye, they got hit, you know, they, that's, <laughs> they do that, you know, but uh Essentially, what we're seeing is, is that, and this is something I wrote about in, in 2016, is that, that backup is not just the, the end, um, you know, the final protection layer. It's, a, it's an integrated protection layer of, of the, the, I guess, layered approach that you need to take. Um, because if they get backup, then you're done. Um, uh, and then you'll have to pay the ransom. Now, maybe that's okay, but, I mean, you're just simply driving things forward. Uh, or kicking it down the road. I'll, I'll pause. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I think that those are all really valid points. And I think so much of it, and in some of the conversations that I've had at some of the virtual conferences and events that I've participated in as well, is yes, cost is certainly part of the equation. That's not going to go anywhere. But just as you said, in order for us to have good backup in order for services to be restored. We have to make this investment and it's not just for, it, it, it's not for what if, we have to future proof moving forward. Um, so it's a huge expansion in terms of, and, and again, it's a cultural shift too, right? Um, so I think this has been such a, a big part of that conversation um, so that you can, and of course you have to make that business case for the cost that's associated with it. But I think peeling back the but, layers and, and in having that future but, proofing. It's, it's really about the capabilities and that's the thing it's, it's we're transitioning away from this 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 the about, from it and things like that just being a cost and looking at the capabilities that it brings so for example cloud is actually more expensive but what does it take off your table it takes off the operations it takes off the refresh it takes off the securing the infrastructure the the, the updating the the um, firmware uh 
doing migrations. Oh gosh, what an undifferentiating thing yes. that is. But so it takes all that stuff off the table. Now, the always on, you know, that allows your IT team to focus on their differentiation as opposed to their operations. Now, now what that's kind of a parody for is what's happening with business. We're expected to do like this always on thing. Now, how can we do that if we don't have the ability to bring back large portions of the environment instantly? And that's something that, that I think it's table stakes right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what you're talking about as well, as we, we think about this idea with the cloud, particularly that actually moves us into our, our next question that we have too. Um, and I want to make sure that we spend ample time on that as well. <laughs> Thanks for moving that for David. <laughs> and and it's, it, it's around that cloud migration and the strategy as well. So I know you already had kind of hinted at some of that as well. And I think a lot of that is it's not going to be the full lift and shift but bringing this into the conversation so that you can start seeing evidence of lower overhead so that you have that automated yep. maintenance moving forward. You have built in backup and redundancies for your security, for your availability moving forward are critical in making that business case to move forward with the cloud migration. We, we talked about hybrid offices as well. I think one of the biggest um, items that I've seen, and I just spoke at an event, um, ITSM 2020 for the UK two weeks ago about this, is hybrid IT. We're going to still, just like you said, have our legacy IT, but now we're also moving into the space of supporting cloud and legacy on-premises. Um, so rather than lift and shift, let's evaluate what we have so that we can start propelling our momentum to move forward for the cloud. Exactly. That's, that's something I've been saying uh, for a while. That, that, that it's the don't look at the cloud as a hypervisor in the sky. And that's it's like a mantra. Repeat after me. The, the cloud is not a hypervisor in the sky. Don't lift and shift. Look at these applications as being something that that you know. What are they? What are, are they to the business? And you know, some of them maybe you can lift and shift if it doesn't require a lot of lot of exactly. uh, virtual CPUs. Maybe they, those go. Then then you know, look at this as being you know, not everything is a hammer. You know, it, it's it's it, you have a toolbox here. You can look at Kubernetes. You can look at um, uh, surrounding a legacy application with with virtual services. You know, it's it's enhancing that application in place. Don't re if you can't retire it. And some app some applications have hundreds of connections inside the business with all this logic that happens. You're never going to be able to retire that. I've talked to one person who's ever <laughs> successfully retired all legacy, and I walked up to her afterwards in Stockholm. I said congratulations you've done what i have never seen anybody else do so uh, don't get frustrated with the fact that maybe there's going to be a portion of your business that doesn't get uh, retired but then look at you know some of these other business functions and say hey look you know we've got a really, really bursty um type uh processing requirement here so maybe containerization is is, is very appropriate and we can re-architect that or we just refactor it excuse me and others, yeah. sorry, I, I'll, I'll throw the re-architect right to you. Go for it, Liz. No, 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 you're, you're good. And I, I think too, this is a little bit what I had mentioned earlier or alluded to earlier, I should say, of kind of doing that cleanse to, to take stock of what do we have yeah. that we have an opportunity for potential re-architecture to expand on what we've been doing to optimize our people and our resources on hand. Um, the ITIL nerd in me is totally going to geek out when I say this, but with cloud migration, it's the opportunity with the guiding principle of start where you are. Take stock yeah. of what there is, have that baseline, and then as you see advantages and opportunities to pivot to the cloud that are truly going to serve you for better scalability, keep you agile and moving forward, use those opportunities. Strike while the iron is hot. <laughs> i tell you what, there's a, there's a pretty good um, resource out there. It's, it's Microsoft's own cloud journey. And it talks about this, this process, actually. It's, you know, I've been saying it for a while, but, but they very clearly articulate it and you can download it. Uh, so, I mean, whether you're going to use Azure or, you know, Google, GCP or, or AWS, I mean, it, it, it's more about the business process and, and it's a people mm -hmm. thing. Uh, very much. And, and, and like I said before, just don't, don't look at all this as a toolbox. You've got retiring, you've got uh, surrounding legacy, you've got uh, re-architecting, maybe, you know, doing a bunch of 
an, a complete re-architecture of, of, of with microservices. Maybe you you think that Kubernetes is going to be the way. You can refactor this application and and just uh, have it, you know, uh, just get get it there because everybody thinks that Kubernetes is the way right now. But uh, I mean, don't take any tool out of the out of the um, out of consideration immediately. You're going to have stuff that you can just move to SaaS. You're going to have stuff that you can lift and shift. You can have stuff that you can do, you know, or re-architect, re refactor, and then surround with legacy and retire. So there, it's business discussion. Yeah, exactly. Fan Fantastic advice all around. Are you saying that Kubernetes can't fix everything? Wow, breaking news. <laughs> uh, the solid advice. Um, let's keep on rolling here. I'm going to skip the next question, if that's okay, and move on to this one. Uh, we, I know we talked earlier about ransomware. This was a very common theme in the list of challenges submitted by the audience. Uh, any recommendations on how to better protect ourselves from ransomware? Uh, Liz, you want to start? Sure. So I think, um, again, part of this is bridging that dynamic with your users on security, period. Um, so giving them the educational resources that they understand so that they, they know what could happen in the environment. But I also think that it's really important along these same lines for our teams to be able, the teams that are responsible for protecting against these, um, to have centralized resources to collect, consolidate, and analyze the different events that are taking place within your network. So giving you that heightened visibility to act and be able to report around and see what's taking place so that you can make the appropriate actions moving forward to prevent this. Um, and again, to heighten those educational resources, having that audit trail for what's been taking place as well. Um, so that's just kind of some baseline. Uh, Robert, what are some of your thoughts around this as well for future protection? <laughs> Assume you're going to be hit. That's the first thing you got to do. Start with that 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 uh, assumption, and once you start with that assumption, then you can design uh, a lot of business processes, a lot of resiliency, um, a lot of human aspects of of uh, ransomware. Looking at at what the paper corollaries are for for some of the processes, is establishing what some of the most important functions are. This is really straight just BCM, business continuity management um, mm -hmm. type stuff. Looking at it, making sure your playbooks are set up so that you know if every if all my IT functions are gone, how can I operate my business? How can I make shipments? How can I get the, the trucks into the, the loading bays and the, the, the pallets on them and the, the correct uh, labels stuck to them and then, then get those out the door? How can I keep my business going. Now that means that, that backup becomes an integral part, not just the detection for the very beginning, the training, all the, the, the uh, segmentation of the network, uh, the passive survivability. It's a term that I came up with in, in 2017. Uh, that's a warship design that, that uh, essentially assumes that, that something is going to be hit and it should not sink. So that's, that's micro segmentation, segment, segmenting the network, uh, looking at, at uh, individual um, profiles of, of um, applications and whitelisting the process that they're, they're allowed to use, um, making sure that the admin credentials um, are uh, varied enough um, for various different things. And one other thing, I, I usually say get back up off of the network to some degree, but not, not, not it needs to be connected, but it, it needs to be connected with a dedicated network of, um, virtual net VLAN, whatever, but uh, have uh, do not have domain admin credentials associated with that or anything that's connected to it. Now, again, we sell we sell backup, so I think we do a pretty good job there, uh, out of the box. But uh, the the long and short of it is is that that if you're not using us, the advice is really look at your environment, make sure that if it's not air gapped, you're not using tape, or if you're using cloud do you have um, two different accounts within that that you're replicating between so that they're they're isolated you have to assume that, that somebody's going to get into your environment and have complete access and time and motivation uh, at least that's what I'm seeing right now I mean nasty stuff like moving moving your time servers forward if you're not using like you know some sort of a Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But you 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 move the time service forward, and 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 it drops all your snapshots, and you th all that that DR capability you thought you had. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. Scary stuff. Very scary times. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to protecting your environment and your company's data. Um, great advice. Uh, let's Assume move you'll on be hit. here. That's Assume right. You'll be hit. Build like that. That's right. Um, kind of moving on here to the million dollar question. What are the trends that will shape the world of IT in 2021? Uh, and what technologies, kind of a two part, should I be implementing now to prepare for the future? Uh, Robert, you want to start with that? Oh, good. Liz, Liz, I've been, I've been, I've been consuming airtime. She's a head geek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we've had a we've had a really good rapport today. I've I've enjoyed <laughs> our banter back and forth. We probably could go longer than the hour that we're allotted, um, which some of you yeah. guys might enjoy and other people <laughs> might want to tune out. Um, but I, I you'll, think you'll miss the, the first thirty minutes. We talked yeah, for a while, so <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, so I think that some of the biggest trends that we have seen that have absolutely shaped how teams have come out of this with such resiliency and what they're going to continue to implement moving forward. It seems so simple. It's automation. I, th I think that that's one of the biggest trends. We have to continue to find ways um, to not fear automation possibilities, but embrace them to make us better, to make our employees' lives easier. Um, and there's so many opportunities to streamline that. I loved at the beginning of this, um, Robert, you spoke about a checklist. I think there are so many business-based processes that are checklist-oriented that we could automate for everyone's greater good and benefit. Um, so I think that that's one big one. Go ahead. Have you, have you heard of the, just you 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 kind of followed into exactly what I was about to say. Uh, <laughs> but have you heard of these these uh, AI um, corporate assistants? You know what I'm talking about? They're, they're like self service. You can you can automate uh, individual employees. And I, I I find the idea kind of interesting because what if like you could set? Yeah, okay, go ahead. It is, it is an interesting topic because it's also along the same lines of some of those those virtual bots or your like chat bot assistants, yeah. right? So you're having those users there to perform that. And I certainly think that there are potential functions where those are going to be great in making sure, like if you take it down really simple, when I talked about knowledge management, having a resource like that to automate the suggestion of what article a user should consume to help them troubleshoot how to access the VPN. Something like that is in a, a terrific utilization of that technology to make your employees' lives simplified, but give time back in your technician's day and your other IT users so that they can focus on those larger projects. So, so, I mean, like 10 years ago, or actually more than that, there was like this whole BPM thing, the business process management, and there's these automated tools that were popping up and they, they would automate these processes and kick off all these different things. But what if, you know, you could give each individual employee something like that for their function? You know, that's that's sort of one of the things that I'm thinking. And I, I know there are so, uh, vendors out there that do this, but it, it's that you're looking for like these these AI personal assistants. And I think, you know, in, in our 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 drive towards extreme automation, um, you know, refining the way that we're doing things. What if, you know, you, you could look for, um, if I get this number of, 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 of uh, complaints from, you know, this particular source, and maybe it's going to your help desk and you don't, they're all going in silos and people don't identify it. It's problem re-identification, so to speak. Um, then maybe I've gotten over a threshold and we need to actually look at that array. You know, maybe we've got a problem here. You know, maybe it's a, a problem with the switch or, you know, if, if you're looking at, at any sort of uh, service management, I'll toss the ball to Liz. <laughs> I think that, yeah, um, I could talk about that for, for days. And I, I think something else that's important um, on that end as well, we, we talk about automation, but I think something else that's clearly going to be shaping L elements moving forward of how we interact and what we're responsible for is going to boil down to how we're interacting with the data. Um, so data has always been so big. That's a trend that's never going to fade. It's, it's not a fad. <laughs> um, so I think that that's another key component as well as how are we aligning our data sources? How are we using our data to make data-driven decisions to future-proof for the business to make those efficient implementations and so forth? 
So I think one of the things that, that I'd be looking for is, is anything that, that is um, looking promising from a collaboration standpoint. Um, you know, what we've got right now with Teams, Zoom, all these platforms and things like that, that I've seen like a little, lot of good tries, um, but we're still missing this. I mean, maybe it's augmented reality, maybe it's virtual reality, maybe it's it's uh, some sort of passive identify uh, um, um, notification. I'm not sure what it is, and I've been looking for it for over 10 years now, um, since uh, the the probably the mid mid uh, 2000s. Um, so that's what I would be looking for. It's not here yet, um, and until it's there. I don't really see that we're going to get much past a, a hybrid workplace, uh, remote. Um, any, one of the things that, that I would look for with remote is, again, looking for some of the things that, that folks have uh, done with open source uh, organizations, um, you know, the, where, where people have never met, uh, these collaboration methods that they're using, and then try to, try to pull that out and, and, and use it for onboarding, um, mentoring, reverse mentoring is kind of an interesting idea, and that's if you've got like a a, a, uh, a group of um, employees, some young, some old, and uh, some in the middle. Well, these 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 millennials might know a lot about all these social media things, and they can train like some of the folks uh, that are that are better with your legacy and and back, vice versa. So I mean, it's it's one of those things where where you can learn discipline. From the 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 veterans and the the, the younger younger folks can can uh, teach the folks uh, how to how to do something a little bit more progressive. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Anyway, collaboration yeah. teams. Yeah, absolutely. Great ideas, great suggestions. We've got two minutes left, uh, so we're moving into a rapid fire time here. Last question. Um, I know this is something we all struggle with, uh, Liz. How can we stay up to date on constantly evolving technology? Um, I think some of the basic ones would be looking towards the communities that you're currently a part of. We've been really fortunate because so much is virtual and I know that folks are feeling that virtual fatigue. However, panels like this, looking towards the different communities that you're involved in through LinkedIn, through other virtual events, I think are such a great source for that. And just as Robert and I have been talking all along, it still fosters a sense of legitimate human community, being able to have a video dialogue or connecting with them in a chat room at a virtual event. Um, so I think that that is a key way that you're going to continue to stay on top of what's happening um, in the tech universe and sphere, technology itself um, is staying as tight knit to those communities as possible. Yeah, so stop, stop trying to hire every time there's a new technology. Establish that you're going to constantly be growing. Now, this, is, this can burn you out. So you, you first you have to say, okay, I'm not going to reach for a new FTE because the CFO isn't going to approve it. Anyway, you already know that. And stop saying that skills gaps are a blocker for your innovation. If you stop those things, then suddenly you go into what I, I, I could call a growth mindset. And when you do that, then you look at, okay, we're going to grow our own skills. And now it's not going to take yes. us, you know, maybe we're, we're going to pick up some folks that are younger uh, or some folks that are that have the right mindset, and these are folks that don't, you know, look like, you know, they say, um, I don't know this, but I know how to learn it. So you're looking for people who are going to be able to learn it. Another thing, I'm going to plug this book, read it. Uh, I don't have, I don't get any money out of it, but it's a great book, um, and it teaches you about the growth mindset, uh, and that's something that I think that that a lot of IT folks need to learn. And stop reaching for FTEs every time there's a new technology because you're never going to be able to find somebody who's got experience doing it that's looking for a job. Uh, in the questions box for everyone out there, another great resource on IT trends. Um, I want to now announce the winners of our three Amazon $100 gift cards. These are going to Kenneth Lim from Virginia, Bill Moschella from Pennsylvania, and Gary Hellander from Texas. Uh, and of course, I want to remind everyone, uh, don't forget to check out the links that are there in your audience console under handouts for uh, more information on Rubrik and SolarWinds. Uh, Liz and Robert, fantastic advice. Uh, really love the conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks so much for your engaging thanks, questions Liz. and participation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.